And all I want to do Is lay it all down Pour it all out at your feet A few months ago, my cousin posted on Facebook that uh, she had been robbed. And so when the police came, she said she finally calmed down and began to explain to her what had happened and, uh, and how she felt. And when they asked her for a description of the assailant, she said, yeah, right over there, it's pump number three. <laughs> you ever feel like that? You go to the, get gas, you go, oh my goodness, I've never paid $100 to fill my tank before. Oh my goodness, you know, I'm getting robbed and buying eggs, buying lumber, buying about anything today. I mean, prices have just skyrocketed. We're in a, just a very interesting period, which follows this, this, this roller coaster ride of the last two and a half years. I mean, we rode a great season of economic recovery until COVID hit and interrupted it. We went from a high of almost 30,000 points on the Dow um, Jones Index in February to the middle of March dropping down to about 20,000. And, and some of you who have uh, 401ks, retirement funds, watch your money evaporate, like poof. In just a matter of weeks, just a, just a couple weeks, you may have lost 100, 200, quarter million dollars. That's a lot of money. Uh, but, but praise God, things rebounded, largely in part to our government, cranking out some more bills and sending you and me checks and stimulating the economy which isn't real economic growth. It's, it's kind of a, a phony economic growth because now we're paying for it with inflation and that money we receive, we're paying back in higher prices. And so I don't think there's ever been a time when it's been more important for us to know, God, how do you want me to handle this stuff? Because people are making decisions about their jobs, how they want to work, what do they want to work, how much they need to make. They're thinking about retirement. They're, they're, they're thinking about debt and all these kinds of things. And we need wisdom in how to manage money because it is... Um, a big part of life. It's not the biggest part of life, but it is a big part of life. You deal with it almost every single day to pay bills, to go out to eat, to make decisions. We think about it. We deal with it constantly. That's why I think the book of Proverbs is so incredible because we've been looking through this ancient book in the Bible that is Proverbs from a man. Actually, there's a few writers of it, but the majority of it is written by a man named Solomon. Solomon became blessed by God with greater wisdom than any human being has ever had. I would say until Jesus came. But Solomon was the wisest man in the world. People came from all over to come to him, ask him questions, and learn from him. And they were in awe of the wisdom he had. And fortunately, a lot of those Proverbs are put in this book. They cover things from friendship to marriage to, you know, personal life to all, all aspects, including a lot of Proverbs that deal with finances. Now, here's something else you might not know about Solomon. Not only was he the wisest man, and in his day, he was the wealthiest man in the world. God actually blessed him with wealth. And as wealth came from four different streams, he was a businessman. He, he had ships that dealt with commodities and transporting spices and things like that. He, um, he received tribute from other neighboring countries that actually paid money to stay in good standing with Israel. You know, God's hand is on that nation. We want to be in good standing with them. We don't want to be enemies. We're going to pay them money to make sure that we're in a good place with them. Uh, we learn in the book of, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament that um, he also got gifts. People would come to him and, and bring chariots and horses and mules. There was a lady from the, called Queen of Sheba. She was so impressed with Solomon's wisdom and how he ran his empire that she actually gave him all kinds of gifts, including four and a half tons of gold. That's a lot of gold. And then there was taxation. The people were taxed. And when you're in a monarchy... Oftentimes, the money collected in taxes does not go to the government, it goes to the king. And so when he accumulated every year, uh, based on Old Testament scriptures, the equivalent of a billion dollars a year in gold. That's, that was, the, that was the, the main economic uh, trading medium. They didn't have printed money. Oftentimes, it was gold and it was silver. It says that Solomon made silver as common as stone in Jerusalem. It also says that all of his cups, all of them, I mean, every single one of his drinking utensils was made of gold, just like you. No, I don't have a gold cup. Yeah, every single one made of gold. I mean, he was a very wealthy man. Something else you probably need to know about Solomon. He died a very unhappy man. 
There's another book in the Bible, actually two other books credited to him. One is Song of Solomon, believed to be written earlier when he was a young man. Ecclesiastes, written when he was an older man, looking back on his life and having a lot of regrets. A lot of regrets came from thinking money was really the solution and and money was going to make him happy, and it didn't. And so when when he gets to the very end of the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, you know what? This is really what life is all about. Fear God, keep his commandments. Keep his commandments. See, Jesus did a better job of practicing what he preached, and Jesus came saying a lot of the same things Solomon said. Jesus has a lot to say about how we handle finances, but Jesus made it very clear that that money can either be a tool or it can be a tyrant. It can be a tool that serves us or a tyrant that we serve. And we have to be very careful that it doesn't master us, but that we master it. It's a spiritual issue. Money is a spiritual issue, so we have to handle it carefully, carefully. I know that many of you are in a position where, man, I, I need, Pastor, I need some help with this because we're not doing well as a family. We're, not, we're arguing as a couple. Or I'm afraid because I'm getting close to retirement and I'm not sure what I'm going to do. And I'm just going to encourage you, listen to scriptures. Listen to what God has to say. He has things to say in scripture that's contrary to many of the things you hear in our culture but they've been proven time and time again to work and to give financial peace. So I'm going to go through Proverbs today and actually to give you a little, little piece, we're not going to go through the whole sermon. Actually, the more I got into it, it says we, we're going to save half of it till next week. There's just so much in here that we need to cover. So we're going to do those first three points today and we'll finish the other three next week. But I, I, I'm convinced that if you're searching for guidance, you'll find it here in the book of Proverbs, okay? Let's just pause and pray before we dive in. Father, thank you for the privilege of managing money Give us wisdom, Lord, because it can be a volatile issue. It can be uh, such a spiritual thing. And so we ask for your, your guidance and your favor that we may handle it in a way that pleases you, blesses our families, and encourages the growth of your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So one of the the aspects of money is just managing it as a whole. So here's my statement that I gained from Proverbs. Pay attention to your finances. That's smart, but obsessing over money is idolatry. Here's what he writes in Proverbs 27. Know well the condition of your flocks and give attention to your herds, for riches do not last forever. Uh, And does a crown endure to all generations? He says, pay attention to your herd and your flocks. Why? Because in an agrarian society, which is most of biblical history, people had their wealth tied up in their land and their animals and their crops, what they could produce. That was their wealth. And animals die off. You've got to keep birthing animals. You've got to keep the flocks growing so you can have, that, that's your source of wealth. If you want to see a rich person, you saw the size of their herds, the size of their flocks. He asked rhetorically, does a kingdom last forever? Of course not. We all know that. Just look around. Dynasties may go a few generations, and then someone else rises up, and a new king and a new kingdom is established. Surely they don't. And maybe Solomon's sending a message to his own children saying, hey, you, you guys have grown up in royalty. You've had it easy, but it's not always going to be that way. You know, that happens in businesses. We find that uh, a man or a woman or a couple starts a business, and they They work hard. They devote themselves to it. They pour themselves into it. They establish something, and it grows, and the brand name um, gets very familiar, and maybe they establish franchises, and then those people get older, and their desire in their heart is, I want my kids to take the baton and run with this. But here's the problem. Not, Not always do those kids share the same work ethic or the vision or the drive or the skills to keep it going. And so oftentimes it starts to fade, and by the third generation, it it sometimes can be destroyed or passed on to someone else because because they don't have the same uh, values as the parents did. Now, some do. You know, I've been impressed with Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A, when Truett Cathy passed it on to his kids, they've done a pretty good job of keeping that thing going. And I I had the privilege a few years ago of going to Atlanta, Georgia to tour their facility and hear their story. It was very uh, very inspiring. And then I had, got to go across the street. Not everybody gets to do this, but we knew someone in the corporation that took us across the street to a building called Hatch. Hatch is where they hatch all their new ideas. And so if you have a, a new recipe, um, if you're going to do mac and cheese, or if you're going to do a different kind of a spice on a chicken sandwich or a new salad, they test it there. Then they, they have their employees eat it, and they evaluate it and adjust the spices. There's a kitchen there. There's whiteboards in that place. There's little meeting rooms where people uh, make uh, ideas and marketing plans. And so we got to go through all that. And then we went over to the cafeteria, 
and got to eat. And guess what food they served? Pizza. And Chick-fil-A. Yeah, you can have Chick-fil-A, all the different varieties of Chick-fil-A and other stuff. So they don't want people getting sick of Chick-fil-A every day. But while we were there, this guy comes in. He's rather short. And I says, I think I know that guy. And it was uh, Dan Cathy. He's chairman of Chick-fil-A. And so I, I walked over to him and I said, I'll bet you'd like a picture with me. So here it is. Um, I got a picture with him. And he reached over and turned my cup to make sure the chicken was facing just right. He did that because he's always thinking about marketing. He's going to put that on, on Facebook. Make sure you get it right, sir. And uh, Wonderful. But you know what? Will his kids have the same drive? I don't know. It may change over time. It may, it may get sold to somebody else. Solomon is just basically saying, hey, this doesn't last forever. Think about it. Think about your finances, where you're going with things. That's why even as a church, we realize that at different stages of life, you've got to be thinking about the issues you're dealing with. So when you're young and you're working, a lot of times you just get so consumed with just getting by. Like, I, we just got to pay the rent. Got to get food on the table. We splurge a little bit here and there. That's all we're thinking about. And then kids come. And then you have to start realizing as the kids get older, we've got to set aside money for school. And then as they get older, what about college? What are we going to do about college? We've got to figure this out. So we start putting money aside for college. And then after that, you start thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm going to be retiring in the next 10 years or so. What are we going to do? And I'll tell you this, Social Security will not carry you unless you're going to live with your kids. It wasn't, meant to, it wasn't meant to provide for your retirement. It was meant to supplement your retirement. But so many people have done very little else and think somehow Social Security is going to be there. It may not be there for all of us. We don't know. We have to pay attention to it. And that's why we as a church are very committed to a, a program called Financial Peace University. How many of you have taken that? A lot of you. It, you know, it's, it's a good model taking biblical principles to teach you how to put in place some certain baby steps, they call them, like setting up an emergency fund and other things, so you can truly have financial peace. And here's the good news. We are offering it in September, this fall, for free. If you've never taken it, please, by all means, do your family a favor. Take it. You'll gain some things you've never learned before about finances. And uh, we are here to, to walk it with you. If you can't take it in person, you can even do it online. There's some things you can access online. But we paid the fee for our whole church to participate in it. And it's called a group plan kind of a thing. And we want you to be able to, to come and not feel like finances are hindering you from being part of it. It will free up finances in your life so you can do some other things. Now, think about where you are financially. Just don't obsess about it. It's, it's easy to go to the other side. Now, some people might say, oh, pastor, I don't worry about my finances because I'm just trusting Jesus. Hmm. Okay. Jesus gave you this thing up here. It's called brain. He's giving you these things called hands. Got to work. Got to think. You know, he, I know that God promises to provide for the sparrows, but God doesn't deliver Amazon Prime packages of worms to their nest. They've got to partner with them. We partner with God in, in providing, and we do it through work. But it's very easy to become consumed by money and what it does. See, if you keep thinking about money all the time, that's, that's one of the things when you're young, thinking, man, if I could make money, oh, if I could make a lot of money, that'd be really cool, because then I could be really happy. Bad news, money doesn't make you happy. We sometimes think that money will solve problems, and honestly, it does solve some problems. I mean, if you've got a broken down car and you have money, you can get it fixed. If you need surgery and have money, you can get surgery. If you want to go to college and go to a nice university, money can open the doors for you. So there's a lot of problems that money can solve, but while money can do lots of good, it doesn't make you a good person. It doesn't make you a happier or better person. But here's what it does. It magnifies who you are. It exposes who you are. For example, if you're someone who's lonely and you, and, and you get a big contract or a bonus and, and you want to spend it, oh, you'll get a lot of friends. But they're not there because they love you. They love your money. And when you discover that, you become even super lonely. You can be depressed and then have money to go do all these fun things, a lot of great experiences, and then when the money's gone, you're so depressed. You're, all, you're worse off then than you were before. And the reason I know this is watch lottery winners. How many of them are super thrilled and happy after they've won the lottery? No, they blew, they blew it. There's a lady I, I, I 
I was told over yesterday, her parents were in this church for years. They both passed away, but when they passed away, they left an inheritance to their kids. And the oldest child took an inheritance of beyond a quarter of a million dollars and in one year squandered it. Squandered it. It's gone. And she's bitter and she's angry and she's distant from the rest of her family. It did not make her better. It did not make her happier. Money can ruin a marriage. It can separate siblings. It can lead you into great temptations. Think of the athletes who get big contracts. They're they're 19 to 21 years old and they're millionaires all of a sudden. And what they do with the money, they're like the prodigal son who squanders it on reckless living, finding themselves in the pig pen. And the problem isn't that money's bad. Money's neutral. Money's not good or bad. It's, it's what we do with money. Maybe, maybe more accurately, it's what money does to us. That's what it is. What does money do to you? Because it can have like a godlike power. That's what it becomes idolatry, when it has a godlike power over us. That's why Paul warned in Hebrews. He says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Don't love money, love God, love people. Love God, love people, don't love money. Why? Because God's going to stay with you. He'll stay with you to the end. He'll stay with you after the end. Money won't. I know that, I know that because I've done a lot of funerals. There's no luggage racks on caskets. There's no place to stuff your dollar bills to take with you. Money can't save you from death, and it won't help you beyond death. So, so don't love it. God will help you at death, and God will help you beyond death. Love him. He'll never leave you or forsake you. But by all means, don't love money. It's the love of money. It's not money. It's the love of money that creates problems. It doesn't mean that money can't do some nice things. I mean, God gives money for for our enjoyment. We don't don't have to be um, in poverty to follow God. I mean, if God allows you to have money to upgrade a car, to, to get some nice clothes, to take your family out to eat on occasion... It's a good thing. We should never feel ashamed with that. We should never feel like God wouldn't want us to do those things. But here's the difference. It's being able to do those things and enjoying them or feeling like you have to do those things to be happy. Like, I can't be happy without a new car. I can't be happy without that purse. I can't be happy without, you know, that new truck. I can't be happy without that house. Then it's a problem. Then money's become an idol to us. We don't have to have things. We just have to have God. You know, I I know poverty has its challenges, but honestly, wealth has challenges too. Wealth wealth brings all kinds of people wanting your money, knocking on your door, asking for donations, constant phone calls and appeal letters, Um, scammers attacking you, trying to have access to your funds, thieves taking what you have. Julie and I have been watching a series that's all about the 1973 kidnapping of John Paul Getty III. J. Paul Getty, the, the grandfather, at the time, in the early 70s, was one of the wealthiest men in the world, created a whole billion-dollar empire on oil. And so when his grandson was kidnapped, he actually went on the air to be to a national, international TV to say, um, I will not give these kidnappers one cent. Because they asked for $17 million. $17 million. Well, if you follow that story, you know that in the end, he ended up giving some money to get his grandson back, but that was only after receiving a gruesome package in the mail. You know, if you're rich, that's a concern. People are after what I have. They may even leverage my kids, grandkids, to get something from me. But there's actually another concern. It says in Proverbs 13, 8, the ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man hears no threat. I don't know if Solomon's speaking specifically of a literal ransom or the fact that when you're rich, you're kind of held hostage to your money. I mean, think about this. If you've got a lot of money invested in stocks, you're, you're always watching the news. You're always watching the stock market. You're, you're almost like you're a slave to the stock market because if the, mon- if the numbers go up, you're thrilled. If it goes down, now you start to panic. You're concerned about it. You're paying attention to it. Poor people don't do that. When the stock market goes up and down, a poor person says, you know what? I've got my money in this envelope right under my mattress. Or I have it in, in, my, in the end account, dressed down the street, and it's staying the same rate every single day. I don't worry about it. 
There's temptations to the rich. There's temptations that affect the poor. Both of them have their unique struggles. But I love this prayer that a man named Agur says in Proverbs 30. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. In other words, his prayer was, God, I pray I don't become poor. And God, I... I pray I don't become rich. I, I just pray I'll be content. And I think that is such a prayer of maturity. Have, I, I'm sure some of us have prayed the prayer, God, I, I dearly don't want to be poor. I don't want our family to be poor. But have you, have you gone to the other side and said, God, I also pray you don't make us rich. We probably prayed that God would make us rich. But what if we could just say, God, I don't want, it, I don't want either side. They both have their temptations. They both have their dangers. I want to be in the place in the middle where I can just say, I'm amply supplied by you. I'm content. Think about where you are financially. Pay attention to it, but don't obsess over it. Okay, what about earning it? Earning it. Making money is good, but if that's your biggest goal, you're foolish. Big focus of adult life is what? Your work. 40-some years, you're making wages, you're paying bills, you know, your whole life revolves around your job uh, because that's where you go, that's where you spend a majority of your time, and you exchange your effort and maybe your, your brain power, um, your time to give to someone else who then gives you money for that in exchange. And that's what you're trading your work for, part of your, lo- your life for part of their life. And hard work is rewarded. It says, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. You might be surprised that you might be living or even sitting next to someone who's a millionaire. And not because they inherited it, simply because they worked a job, got a decent wage, and was very disciplined and not overspending and saving on a regular basis. And over the course of time, their accounts built up. By the time they retired, they actually had over a million dollars in their retirement or savings accounts. You know, it's just, the, it's just the discipline, it's the steadiness that takes place. It says, whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Meaning, don't, don't chase after get-quick-rich schemes. A lot of seminars are out there. A lot of people will wave something behind you, in front of you and say, hey, do this, and you can make money quick and easy. Quick and easy. That's, that's a red flag right from the beginning. And usually it's those who are promoting that that are getting rich quick on you. Your fee to to take the seminar, your fee to buy the products. I mean, there are some things out there, multi-level marketing that can grow and if you're disciplined can do well, but just be cautious of these get rich quick schemes. And I think one of the biggest um, concerns I have in our culture today, because it's promoted constantly, and you're gonna see it during football season like crazy, is gambling. And we don't call it gambling anymore. What do we call it? Gaming. Gaming. It's like a game. It's fun. You just get to play with my money, see what happens. See, in 19, um, or excuse me, in the year 2018, our federal government legalized gambling, allowed states to do their own thing. And so instead of you having to go to Las Vegas, baby, Las Vegas comes to you. You can gamble right on your phone. Now, people will say, well, I guess it's bound to happen. You can't legislate morality. I hear that a lot with different issues. You can't legislate morality. Laws are moral. Every law virtually is legislating some kind of morality, somebody's morality, saying this is right, this is wrong. The difference is, I think what people are thinking is, you can't make people be moral. That's true. But all laws are moral. They're they're holding up something good and saying, this is bad, this is good. If you you do the bad thing, there's a consequence for it. And so in in our culture that we grew up in, most of us grew up in a culture where the Judeo-Christian values were just common in our country. Things like devotion to your spouse, being devoted till death would separate you. That was just like normal. People just assume that. You're going to be faithful to your husband and wife. You don't have affairs outside the relationship. You're devoted to that. It was just assumed that you don't get drunk and you don't take drugs and, um, and you don't gamble. You don't throw money away on gambling. You don't watch pornography. That was all kind of, that's just built in the fabric of our culture until 
kind of recently. A lot of these things are, are, are being said, well, you know, maybe that's not so bad after all. Maybe it's okay to take a little drug, smoke some weed, have some pill. I mean, just do it responsibly. Maybe it's okay to gamble. Just be careful what you do. The problem is, is we don't have a moral base anymore. If we're going to throw the Bible out and Judeo-Christian values, okay, whose morality? The Republicans? The Democrats? The Libertarians? Whose morality are we, are we pushing in government? And now our culture has spiraled to such a place that things that used to be considered dishonorable are promoted as normal. And one of those is gambling. Gambling. Think about it. I've watched sports and some very respectable athletes now are going online to encourage people to gamble. I'm talking like Wayne Gretzky and Charles Barkley, uh, Drew Brees, and our beloved Peyton Manning. You too can be a Caesar. You can be a king. You could strike it big and make a lot of money very quick. And now you can gamble on just about everything. Sports, of course. Do you know you can go on a, um, the weather app? Uh, go, the, I think it's the National Weather Service or something like that, and actually gamble on the temperature, whether it'll hit the temperature, go above or below. People are gambling on coin flips, on, on such little intricate things. They're, they're gambling on voting, who's going to win elections. They're, one of the biggest... Um, Gambling items during COVID was marble racing. Marble racing. Ever been interested in marble racing? No, never. Oh, but now it's a way to make money? I'm really interested in marble racing. People who never watched sports before are very interested in sports, not because they want their team to win, but they want them to win. But here's, here's why this is so dangerous. And it, gambling exploded during COVID because people got lonely at home and then they got stimulus checks and got money sometimes beyond what they thought they would need, and so it became expendable money we could gamble with. But you may never consider smoking pot or popping opioids, but winning a bet does virtually the same thing to your brain that drugs do. The American Psychiatric Association, through a lot of research, changed the category of, of what gambling did to a person because he said, it does something to the chemistry, the circuitry of your brain. It's like this hit of dopamine. Winning gives you a charge. And you could lose, 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 but I won. I won. That felt so good. I love that feeling. I want to do it again. And just like drugs, you, you, you want to keep doing it until you get a bigger hit, bigger hit, bigger hit. And people, you know, my wife did taxes for a number of years. She had a, a husband come in once, and he was just irate because he didn't realize this, but his wife had gambled away $400,000 in one year. I, I've, I can't even imagine. How can you do that? Because of that feeling, of, the next one's going to be the winner. The next one's going to be the winner. And, and we are living in a place now where people are kind of hopeless in some ways. Why not, why not gamble on it? Why not be risky? Why not throw a bunch of money at Bitcoin or day trading and see what happens? So-and-so got rich doing it. Maybe I could get rich. And some are lucky and do, but most are not. The only guaranteed winners in the lottery and, and at casinos are the government and the casinos. They're guaranteed to win. You're guaranteed pretty much to lose. It says in, in Scripture, just earn money the old-fashioned way. Don't try to get rich quick. Whoever is slothful will not roast his game, but the diligent man will get precious wealth. How do you do that? Through hard work. It's called work because it's work. And you pour your life into it. But here's the danger. You could actually enjoy your work so much, it then becomes an idol. You become what's called a workaholic. You bring your work home. You find all your self-esteem at your work because people think you're the greatest, you're a hero, you're important. You love the money you get from your job and the extra hours you put in. I tasted that when I got my first real job being a stock boy at Kmart. I had asked that I want Sundays off because that's my day to go to church and then Sunday night is youth group. So I don't want to work Sundays. I'll work any other evening or the weekend on Saturday, but not Sundays. And then one day after I've been working for over a year, I was asked to fill in for someone on a Sunday. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And then I discovered you get paid time and a half on Sunday. It's like a 50% raise. I said, that's pretty cool. Wow, I can make a lot more money working Sundays than any other day of the week. So I said, hey, you know what? If other Sundays come up, let me know because I might be able to work a few Sundays here and there. Pretty soon I was working just about every Sunday. And then the holidays came and I found out you can make double time on the holiday. That's like a 100% increase. So 
So I would work on Thanksgiving or, or Christmas Eve or other days because I thought, you know, I'm going to make really good money. And, you know, it's felt good to get these big checks. By the way, we didn't get checks. We actually got envelopes with cash in when we went to collect on every other Friday. And you open that envelope, you go, wow, look at all that money. And then, and then the Lord started to convict me saying, so now your job's replaced your time with me. Well, no, Lord, not. I still love you. I still love you. You're still number one in my life. Uh, but you don't worship me anymore. You don't, you don't fellowship with believers anymore. You don't go to a place where you're growing in your faith anymore. And I started realizing I need, I need to go back to Sundays off. It was affecting me spiritually. Your job can do that. You, you, can, you can work beyond what you need to work. It can ruin a marriage. It can damage your family. It can destroy your health. And it affects you spiritually. It says, do not toil to acquire wealth. Be discerning enough to desist. Be discerning enough that you know when to say no, when to say, hey, I can't work that day. I need a day of rest. See, God, in the cycle of work, worked six days, and what did he do on the seventh? Rested. Not because God was needed to rest, but he was setting an example for us, saying, you, your body needs replenishment. You need to pause and value relationships. Stop working. I've, I'm taking care of you. I've given you a job. Work hard, but then rest, rest well. See, if you have problems setting boundaries, if you have problems wondering if this is an opportunity from the Lord to, to provide for a family need, like God's, you know, you go to your family and say, hey, I've got this opportunity to do this side job. Is that from the Lord or is that from the devil? How do you know? Is God offering it to you to pay a bill or is the devil offering it to you to make money or God? is something we need to pray about. That's why it says, the poor man and the oppressor meet together. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. If you're poor, you need wisdom. If you're rich, you need wisdom. We all need wisdom from the Lord. Making money is good, but if it's the main thing, it's foolish. And then the third thing I'll cover today is uh, borrowing it. A loan gives temporary freedom, but it, but it can rob and enslave you. Can rob and enslave you. If money, if I was a money manager and said, hey, I can give you 15% on your money, maybe 20%. You'd be foolish not to invest in me. But I can't do that. But here's what, here's what we're doing. We are helping someone else get that on our money when we use credit. Do you know the average credit card? Pretty much every credit card averages between 16 and 20% annual interest. And if you rely on payday loans, it's, it's like 300 to 600% annual interest. It's a killer. That's why actually some states have laws against payday loans. It says it's, it's robbing people. It's literally robbing people. They can never pay back. If you don't pay that back in the first week or so, it's like your history because that interest will kill you. Borrowing is very dangerous. It says the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. Borrowing makes you a slave to someone else. You have a debt to them. It may make you feel richer to have a credit card, but it makes you feel richer because in your wallet is someone else's money, not yours. And you're obligated to pay it back and to pay it back with heavy interest. And sometimes when we look at stuff, we go, well, I, I can't afford that, but I think I can afford the payments. That's a, that's a trick. If you can't afford it, maybe God doesn't want you to have it yet. So here's, here's what I think is an issue Instead of asking, what's in your wallet? Let me ask you, what's in your heart? Do you believe God is a good provider? If God's a good provider, why do we often tell God, God, I know you haven't provided, but Visa's willing to provide it. Kohl's is willing to provide it. Amazon's willing to provide it if I get their credit card. So I love you, God, but you're not doing enough for me over here, so I'm going to rely on those cards to give me what I feel I want. That's the danger. It says we're not trusting God. We're trusting other people. We're trusting what they can do for us. Dave Ramsey is adamantly opposed to credit card debt. In fact, he tells people, cut up your cards. I would say there's, there's some value in cards, in credit cards. Um, and we may say, well, I get points with my credit card. You know, I get perks with my credit cards. But credit card companies know that they get you other ways. Their fees, late charges, interest rates, all that. Uh, in the year 2020, credit card companies made, I think it was $176 billion. Billion dollars. 
God wants us to be liberated from debt, spiritual debt, literal debt. He wants us to be free to serve him. It says in Romans 13, 8, oh, no one anything except to love each other for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. It is, a, it is such a glorious feeling to be forgiven, but I would say it's a glorious feeling to be debt-free, to not have credit card payments, to not, even if you get to a place where you say, like, I, I'm fighting to get my mortgage paid off. The American way says, ah, everybody has debt. Everybody has credit card debt. Everybody has mortgage debt, truck debt, all kinds of debt. It's just normal. That's culture. That's not God. The American way is not necessarily God's way. There's one other thing it says about debt in Proverbs. It says, be not one of those who give pledges, who put up security for debts. What it's saying is, don't, don't help someone else go into debt because they're probably not going to be able to pay it, and that just obligates you. And I know sometimes we have family members, like, I really want to help my family out. But just beware, if they're not good managing their money, if they're not hard workers, you probably are never going to get paid back. And that debt's going to fall to you. Sometimes you might help someone over a hump, and that works, but oftentimes it really doesn't work. God wants us to manage money in a way that pleases him. God's not after our money, he's after our heart. He wants to bless us more than we could ever imagine. We'll look more at it, at it next week, how he can do that. But the richest people are not those with the most money, but those who are closest to the heart of Jesus. Wealth comes in our relationship with him. And we know we're in a really good place when we can say like the man in the Proverbs, give me neither poverty nor riches. Just give me Jesus. Just give me Jesus. If I have him, I'm going to be well. And maybe that's where you are today. Maybe you're struggling with issues in your life. Could be finances, could be marriage, could be a lot of different areas. You don't need more money. That's not your real solution. You need more of Jesus.